Yeah, so thank you very much, Geoff. So what I want to do now is to provide you an overview of the evidence synthesis framework Grace was applying to synthesize evidence from primary, primary research data. And I think the, the term evidence synthesis was already brought up by Jochen in his, in his introduction and it will be even more frequently be used now in subsequent talks. So I guess it is now time to clarify actually what evidence synthesis is. And the answer is pretty straightforward. So evidence synthesis refers to the process of gathering together information to answer a specific question. And depending on its attention, the answer can be rather illustrative or proximate. For example, if you want to identify general patterns within a research area, or the answer may be intended to be quantitatively reliable and precise. For example, if you want to determine input parameters for a quantitative model. And in answer to to, to answer both kind of questions, what is normally done is that literature reviews are performed, which may vary considerably in how they are conducted. And in more generally speaking, so unless they do not follow an a priori defined and documented procedure that employs specific means to identify and evaluate included studies, they are usually referred to as being narrative. And in contrast to this narrative um, approach, evidence synthesis approach, um, alternative way um, proposed by systematic reviews, they try to circumvent these potential limitations um, by following a highly structured, reproducible and rigorous approach for answering a specific question. Systematic reviews, they have um, the capacity to provide a defensible answer to a specific question by twofold. The first one by increasing precision by the performance of a quantitative data synthesis, if it is feasible based on the data which are available. And secondly, they minimize bias by following a standardized procedure which comprises eight so-called core steps. And the core steps are depicted here. So every systematic review starts with the formulation of a specific review question. And based on this question, a protocol is developed a priori before the actual review starts. And the protocol makes the entire methodological detail explicit uh, the whole systematic review has to follow. Based on the protocol then, a search strategy is applied to an adequate amount of databases in order to identify a pool of possibly eligible reports. And these reports are then screened for their relevance for the review by the application of pre-formulated inclusion exclusion criteria. And once you have then filtered the relevant reports from this big pool of um, possibly eligible reports, the relevant data are extracted. And after this data extraction step, what's followed is a critical appraisal step. And this is a very important step within the systematic review procedure, as within these, uh, this step, the tendency of an included study is determined that it might be prone to a systematic error that may influence the, re the reliability of the presented results. Following this critical appraisal step, what you then, if appropriately, what you do is you do a data synthesis step, um, for example, by a quantitative meta-analysis. And the last two steps are then just about presenting the data and interpreting them and drawing conclusions. And what I want to do now is, is to take you through the major core steps of a systematic reviews in order to familiarize you with this overall concept. So the first step is then the development of a review question. And it has to be stressed that not all questions can be addressed by a systematic review, but that the question has to be focused. And focused questions differ from a broad question by that they clearly de define the scope of the question and that in general a study design can be envisaged to, art to address the question. Then you're pretty sure that this question is focused. And in order to facilitate the formulation of a focused question, so-called key elements have to be specified. And a very common uh, question format which can be addressed by a systematic review is um, the so-called PICO structure of, of a question, where it's P is an abbreviation or stands for population, E, intervention, C, comparator, and O, outcome. And here's an example from a review question which was addressed 
uh, in the course of praise by, by Michael. And it's as follows, so does the growing of BTMAs change population or ecological function of non-target animals compared to the growing of conventional non-GMAs? And it's pretty clear, so the, the population you are interested in are uh, non-target animals. The intervention is the growing of BTMAs. The comparator, the comparator is uh, the growing of conventional non-GMAs. And the outcome you are interested in is a change in populations or ecological function of the target population. Okay, so as already said, so based on this question, then a protocol is being developed. And the protocol is a formal specification of how each step of the systematic review will be conducted. It reduces bias by preventing deviations from the planned methods. It ensures um, transparency and repeatability, which is also important in order to allow for an updating by following an agreed um, evaluation scheme. And it allows for active stakeholder involvement, where Armin will talk later on about. And it should also, as an additional quality assurance mechanism, they should undergo an independent peer review process. So based on your protocol, the next step is then uh, to identify all relevant evidence in an unbiased manner. And what is then done is, is that based on your key elements of the questions, or they help to inform the development of an adequate search strategy. And here you see a single search string, which was again taken from the protocol from Michael. And this is then applied to an adequate range of relevant information sources. And this includes bibliographic databases, as well as internet searches, for example, like um, Google Scholar. But also, very importantly, a systematic review should also um, consider gray literature, which is out there and not published via these um, big databases. So the next step would then be the process of systematically checking the literary records identified in the searches against pre-specified eligibility criteria. And how is it normally done? So normally it um, employs a pilot-tested uh, worksheet, which is, very, uh, um, which is shown here. So on the left-hand side, you have your key elements. And based on your key elements, selection criteria are developed. And then you have different boxes like yes, no, unclear. And then the review team member can tick the box if the key element or the selection criteria related to this key element is fulfilled by a study no if it's not fulfilled and unclear if there should be needed some communication within the review team to, to clarify this issue. And it normally um, involves two steps. So a first step uh, covers the title and abstracts of the possibly eligible reports. And then if um, the abstract passes the first screening process, then the selection criteria are applied to the full records. And only if all um, selection criteria, which are made explicit here, are fulfilled, then uh, the record is considered in your systematic review. Okay, so the next step is then, then the extraction of data. And how is it done? It's similar to the one in the literature search or in the screening process, is that you use a so-called data extraction sheet, where here on the left-hand side you have the parameters which need to be extracted, and on the right-hand side is a, slot, is a short explanation that the reviewers really know what they have to extract and to prevent any confusions within the review team. So the next step is a very important step, as already said, in this systematic review procedure, because it's about evaluating the methodological rigor of primary studies and including a risk of bias assessment. And why is it done? I mean, it is clear. So if you consider a bias study in your reviews, then your review outcomes will be biased as well. And so what you have to consider when doing your systematic reviews are um, common types of bias. Let's term it like this, whereas on one hand side, there might be a selection bias, which relates to pre-treatment pre differences between the different groups, then a performance bias, which may um, result uh, to differences in exposure factors, others than the, um, the intervention which is um, applied. Then you may uh, have to deal with the detection bias, uh, where the way outcomes are measured differ between the different groups. And you may also <clears throat> be confronted with an attrition bias, which re refers to imbalanced group sizes. So the next step then is um, the process of combining um, the single study results from independent studies. 
And as already said, it may include a quantitative data synthesis by a meta-analysis um, and pooling the, the different single results of the studies. A meta-analysis may not be appropriate if studies are methodologically too heterogeneous, so this has always to be kept in mind. An alternative uh, approach is always a structured narrative synthesis without pooling the outcomes. And also, the results from this critical appraisal step, so the reliability of the study results, should be considered in this synthesis step. And um, as already said, and as it also applies to the other criteria apply, um, the synthesis approach should be made explicit a priori in the review protocol. So the next two steps I will skip as it is just about presenting your data and drawing evidence-based conclusions on them. And now I just want to introduce the potential benefits of the systematic review methodology to you. So I think it's obvious that systematic reviews can increase precision by means of a quantitative data synthesis. They minimize bias by the elaboration of a review protocol and by the impartial application of assessment criteria, which includes the selection criteria, but also the critical appraisal criteria. It increases transparency by assuring for thorough documentation of the review process, which then on the other side will ensure for the updatability of this review by following an agreed evaluation scheme represented by the review protocol. They facilitate stakeholder involvement throughout different steps in the evidence synthesis process, where Armin will talk about, and they facilitate a transparent communication of assessment detail, uh, details and increase the traceability of the provided conclusions. But um, for sure, systematic reviews are not without limitations. So when thinking about uh, conducting a systematic reviews, you always have to have in mind that um, first of all, what you need to do is that you have to formulate a specific review question, which might be pretty challenging in research areas which are pretty fluid. Then systematic reviews can be highly resource intensive and are, not, are thus not always feasible, whereas resources relate to the availability of manpower, to money, to time. Then systematic reviews do also not provide an immediate answer to a question. So we are not talking about weeks, but rather a month or a year until a systematic review is finalized. And if you wish to have an answer in, in, in a month, a systematic review would not be the appropriate um, tool you want to explore in order to um, answer this question. Then, which is relating to the resources where answers are required for many questions, prioritization of questions may be appropriate. And very importantly, a sufficient and robust primary data have to be available for systematic reviews to provide useful information. So within CRACE, we did not only um, apply the systematic review methodology to synthesize primary research data, but we also applied an alternative approach which is called an evidence map. And evidence maps, they apply the same stringency when identifying and selecting relevant information. But what they do not do is, so you see it here on the right hand side, <clears throat> they normally skip the critical appraisal step and also normally do not provide a quantitative data synthesis. And this is due to the purpose of such a map. So, so a systematic review wants to be as precise as possible and an evidence map aims um, to characterize or map the evidence base. So when you want to know which endpoints are under an investigation or where in the world they are under, under investigation, you would rather prefer this approach than a systematic review. Very similar to systematic reviews, um, associated benefits um, is that they minimize bias by the elaboration of a review protocol and again the impartial application of assessment criteria. They increase transparency by assuring for thorough documentation of the review process and again facilitating the updating of this um, evidence synthesis. And also, let's say, broader frame question can be addressed by an evidence map. Whereas you always have to keep in mind that your review question sets the scope of your whole map. So the review question should allow for the development of an adequate search strategy and also for the development of selection criteria that end up in a handleable amount of uh, records that are retrieved. They are <clears throat> a very powerful tool to identify knowledge gaps and they also help to decide if a systematic review would be worthwhile to be performed on a specific section of that map. And then to decide if we spend now these resources in doing a systematic review as we are now sure that the evidence would um, facilitate its performance. Then again, they um, 
facilitate stakeholder involvement and facilitate a transparent communication of assessment details and increase thus the traceability of review outcomes. So potential limitations, as in the case for systematic reviews, also have to be considered here. So evidence maps as systematic reviews can be resource intensive. They do not um, provide an answer to a question, but rather characterize the evidence base. And as in the case of systematic reviews, where many questions have to be addressed, prioritization of questions may be appropriate. And with this, um, I want to thank you for your attention.